Um, I deliberately formulated my topic with a little tongue in the cheek because uh, I play on a quote from a famous novel by Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, The Master and Margarita. Uh, you may remember that at the beginning of the third act, Satan pompously proclaims to the master that, I quote, manuscripts do not burn. Today, I'd like to uh, check this statement in respect of the Anglo-Saxon charters. Now, before I begin, I should probably explain a few key terms that I will be operating with. Uh, first of all, an Anglo-Saxon diploma is a type of charter issued by a king and that functioned as a title to land. Uh, to make my life easier, I limited my period only to the, period, to the time from 871 to 1066, that is to say, when all Anglo-Saxon kingdoms except Wessex ceased to exist and the documentary production monopoly belonged to the West Saxon house only, because that will make, my, that will make our comparisons much, much easier, much more viable. Secondly, um, what is the word for the land donated with the charter? Well, uh, presently we usually call it bookland. Um, I will also grant that this term is not without its problems, but for the simplicity's sake, I will just call it booklands in this presentation. We may discuss it in a Q&A section. Um, uh, thirdly, uh, an archive. Uh, this is a, a bit tricky for my period because um, Anglo-Saxon England didn't feature archives in our modern sense. So, um, when I say an archive, I will be operating with the Benedictine ecclesiastical communities that preserved uh, the charters up until the dissolution of monasteries by Henry VIII in 1536. Uh, and finally, the, uh, no, probably not finally, the physical types, uh, they are two. Um, at, an Anglo-Saxon diploma could have been preserved as a, a single sheet, for example, like the one you can see on your screen, that is a single sheet from uh, 939, or it could be a cartillary copy, and more, more often than not, it's a cartillary copy that we have to work with, and uh, that brings us to the final problem, the authenticity. Um, it is a very vexed problem for the Anglo-Saxon diplomatics, because sadly, uh, we have to rely on a number of minute features in establishing the reliability of a given document because there are no extant um, features that would authenticate a document without any doubt, such as, for example, a signature or a notary subscription, which necessitates that we, ha that we introduce different grades of authenticity, some of which I put on the screen. But for the purposes of this presentation, I will be operating with documents that uh, scholars believe to be authentic or to have preserved an authentic fact in them. I'm not discussing forms today. Um, as you can see on my slide here, uh, my results uh, are generally recycled from an article I finished uh, last year. Unfortunately, it will probably not be accessible to most of you, uh, to most people, because it's written in Russian. Sadly, so um, if you're interested in more data that I have mined from the corpus that I'm going to be talking about today, you're welcome to contact me on, um, on the email or any other media possible. The corpus, uh, since we're talking about corporate today, I have to disclaim that Anglo-Saxon dip uh, diplomas have not received one published corpus, one printed published corpus to date. Uh, so far, about half is printed in modern editions and about half are still uh, extant only in outdated, obsolete editions from the 19th century or early 20th century. But luckily for us, there exists an online corpus, which is the uh, topic um, of my presentation today, the Electronic Soya. It is itself built on a list by Peter Sawyer produced in uh, 1968. Sadly, it is not a database and it is never designed as a database, but it allows you to, um, uh, to mine the data and make your own data sets that you can then uh, subject to all sorts of uh, statistical or other analyses, which is exactly what I did in my uh, article and that I'm very happy to present you today. Um, some numbers um, for your entertainment. The corpus is estimate, was estimated by Sawyer uh, at 1887, 85 if I'm not mistaken. There have been some rearrangements lately, but they are minute. 
Uh, the Royal Diplomas, they are about 1060, give or take. Uh, there are some questions here. And for the period under discussion, that is from the year 871, I operated with uh, 733 documents, of which 542 meet the authenticity criteria that I disclosed above. Now, um, here's, a, for example, a picture of what the electronic sewer might look like uh, on your screen. Uh, the electronic sewer is not the only database. There exist a few others, but they are more narrow and they're more tapered towards more specific searches. And sadly, again, they are databases, but they do not provide you with the initial raw data. And so if you really want to do your own research, you will have to create your data sets yourself or contact the, or the um, comp compilators uh, and try to figure it out with them. Um, now, um, you might be surprised, but Anglo-Saxon diplomatics have been booming for, I don't know, about 40 years now. But strangely, no one has broached the subject of how representative the corpus that we're working with actually is. So I have put together some opinions for your entertainment. Um, in brief, let me put it this way. The epitome is that, yes, the corpus is probably skewed but um, there's nothing we can do about it and we have to work with what we have, which is, I believe, um, maybe a subject to some revision or some tailoring on our, um, on our part. So my own ambition is try to apply some digital tools and some mathematical methods to try to actually estimate how representative the corpus in, in, in hand is. Naturally, I will not be able to cover all aspects here, and so I will concentrate on, on two and briefly, the geographical and chronological distribution. So first of all, geography. The elephant in the room is that um, the archives themselves are not evenly distributed across the country. Uh, on your left, you can see how the archives look on the map. And on your right, you can see how other potential archives could have looked. Uh, when I say potential, I mean Benedictine houses that existed by 1066, that is the Norman Conquest, but they have not preserved any documents. If you look at the, on, at the map on your right, on your left, I'm sorry, you will see that by and large, the concentration of archives um, corresponds with the, what some historians call Greater Wessex. Let's put it for the simplicity's sake as the Saxon part of England, non-Viking England, which itself might be telling, but if we add the booklands, the situation becomes even more complex. On your right, you can see a map that was helpfully produced for me by one of my colleagues that shows how booklands or the states donated in these charters look on the map um, and how the uh, corresponding archives look on the map. You can see that prima facie, there is some correspondence, but this is just an impressionistic view. So what I decided to do, I decided to crunch some numbers because there theoretically could be two potential uh, explanations of this picture. Either we can be dealing with a situation when the Bookland geography is more or less even. That is to say, if you have uh, an archive in, I don't know, one shire, it will preserve documents from across the country, irrespective of where the donated estate lie. Uh, the other ex um, hypothesis is that there is a pronounced triangle between the donated land, the charter, and where the charter was preserved. And to save the time, I will not beat, beat around the bush and say that the former option is not viable. So what I did, I crunched some numbers using the electronic Sawyer. And um, in the nutshell, here's what I, uh, here's the data that I got. About 67% of all diplo royal diplomas from my period in a given archive would relate to booklands in the same shire. And 23% would relate to uh, booklands in shires that share the border with the incumbent shire. If we switch our optics and if we look at booklands instead, we will see that 33% of booklands in a given shire will be covered in documents that are preserved in the same shire and about 40% from contiguous shires. So that is to say, our first conclusion is that we are in no way uh, able to say what the royal patronage actually looked across the country simply because we have not got any archives in a lot of regions and without them we cannot say what we can actually uh, what their patronage actually was and uh, the argumentum a silencio does, just doesn't work secondly uh, we may ask if uh, the distributions that we see here on the map 
are somehow historically motivated or not. Because, uh, and I'm going to bring just one uh, counter argument to this uh, proposal, um, even within the archived uh, area, the archives um, that lead are Abingdon and, and Winchester, and in them it's only through three cartularies that we have an astonishing number of documents. So maybe it's just a lucky survival, what, what if? Um, to test this hypothesis, and I will again probably break it, uh, br br I'll probably spoil it for myself. Um, I don't believe the first hypothesis is viable. I think uh, we have too many data to actually substantiate the second hypothesis. It just doesn't work. Um, number one, that is, what I did, I tried to um, first, um, I tried a hypothesis if our uh, royal policy has anything to do with how royal resources were concentrated. I will again save a lot of details here because I don't have the time now. The only cross-checking mechanism that I have is the Doomsday Book, which is a static picture and the, the charters are a dynamic picture, so there are lots of caveats here. On the map you can see here how the royal resources are located in 1066 and it might produce a picture that looks as if it is more or less even but it actually isn't. In fact, um, I ran some Pearson correlations and I also built a few linear regressions and yes, it seems that uh, the royal uh, resources are not uh, distributed just um, uh, accidentally. 66% um, of them are located in 10 shires of the Greater Wessex plus Northamptonshire. So again, this would suggest that the royal, the royal resources were not arbitrary even in 1066. And that makes it possible to ask, well, maybe kings donated land where they had resources to donate. And this is exactly what I decided to check using, again, some linear regressions and some Pearson correlations. Pearson correlation said, yes, uh, it's pronounced, and the statistical significant, uh, significance is also viable. Linear regressions themselves are not uh, causal relationships. We have to be very mindful of that. But um, even with the imperfect data that I had uh, using the electronic soy, I could say that for the fiscal units, it worked more or less fine because land could be estimated in either just book lands or individual estates, but every estate was usually measured in a number of fiscal units in it. So for the fiscal units, the linear regression worked more or less okay. It explained 51% of variance, which is not perfect uh, for the historical, for the modern historical analysis, probably not as good. But again, we're dealing with a 1000 year old data set. So what gives? Um, and then I also ask, uh, here you can see how it looks on a scatter plot. Then I also ask a question, can it be that the three cartillaries that I spoke of, that they are so abnormal that um, they're just a lucky survival? And my impression is that it is not the case. Why? Because if I remove them from the data set and try linear regressions without them, they just collapse, they just become dysfunctional, and the data just stops making any sense at all. So my conclusion is that Occam's razor suggests that it's a historically feasible explanation that, um, that uh, kings would donate land where they actually had land. And what is an accident is that in Abingdon and in Winchester, it was just three cartularies that accumulated the data. Had they not survived, maybe the, the regressions would not have worked at all. So we have to ask why those cartularies survived and no, not why, if they are accidental or not. Um, finally, um, chronology. Again, um, the elephant in the room is that we have obvious plateaus and obvious peaks on the graph. And we might again ask ourselves if this is a coincidence or if there is some historical situation behind it. So uh, my hypothesis is that it is not accidental. How I, how I checked it, I used two checks. One, let us remember that not all documents are created equally authentic and some are more authentic than others. And also let's remember that they are preserved in various uh, formats. It can either be a single sheet or it can be a cartillary copy. So on your uh, left-hand side, you can see roughly the same data, but here the uh, different colors indicate different types of authenticity and different types of modes of preservation. Um, impressionistically, we can gather that the periods when 
copies and when authentic documents and when uh, unauthentic copies and unauthentic uh, single sheets were produced, they more or less correlate, which makes us think that if they're so syn synchronous, maybe there is more than just a coincidence behind it. But this is just an impression. This is not an actual, uh, this is not an actual mathematically um, uh, provable data, or is it? In fact, it is. Again, I decided to run a few correlations and linear regressions. Um, the uh, correlations are, well, strong, as you can see on, on your screen. So my preliminary conclusion is that, yes, they were produced in roughly the same periods and they were forged in roughly the same periods. Of course, we have to take, in, uh, take into account that later forgerers might have known the peaks on the graph from their impressions. That is also a possible, um, possible solution. But again, Occam's razor says no. As for linear regressions, they look as follows. Um, again, um, they are not themselves very perfect and we have to remember they're not causal, but nevertheless, I believe they are supportive of my case. My final, uh, my final uh, method, and I rest my case, is that what if our uh, chronology could, what if our chronological distribution could have been affected by external non-archival factors? Um, what I decided to do is to, again, run some linear regressions um, using uh, two uh, types of factors. One is I introduced some coefficients for external pressure put on the kingdom. My thinking was that maybe kings were more generous when they had less strain put on them and less generous when there was a war going around. This is not a perfect method, and I can explain why in the Q&A section. The other uh, suggestion was that maybe the Benedictine reform and the archival or the uh, monastery reforms could have affected how people um, uh, preserve the documents. My linear regression didn't work, as you can see here. My impression is that no, the external factors are not as important in our chronological distribution on the graph that you saw from the beginning. So probably our chronological distribution is more or less representative of how it actually happened. Forgive me this truism. I know uh, Ranke is not the uh, most popular historian these days. So my conclusions are thus. Um, the arrival of the electronic sewer allows us to crunch some numbers and to apply corporate methods to what has been researched from the diplomat diplomaticist's uh, perspective for well, about 200 years at least, and excessively so, or extensively so in the past four or five decades, I believe. Um, my conclusions are three. On the one hand, we have to be mindful that our corpus is very much formed by our archives. So if you had a Shia where you didn't have an archive for whatever reason, you cannot say that this Shia was completely uh, barren of royal patronage because we simply cannot tell. Um, there is a very pronounced re reason to believe that um, if there is no archive, there are no documents, and it's not that the documents weren't produced, they were not preserved. That is the first conclusion we reached. The second is that within the archived area, the distributions are relative to each other, more or less representative, and I emphasize relative to each other. I will not say that they are um, numerically representative, hardly. We can't even assess how much of the corpus we have. The best assessment I've seen is about 10%, but this is just an impressionist, impressionistic assessment. Finally, uh, the chronology, I believe, is, is most representative of what we have, but we again have to take into account that our corpus is not perfect and our selection criteria are also um, liable to all sorts of fallacies. Um, to conclude, I believe this is how we can apply our um, mathematical and statistical methods to uh, um, data sets that we can mine from um, digital corpora, but I would very much like to emphasize that it's humans and people who actually perform these operations, and it's us who make the data sets, and I, I acknowledge that I am myself am biased, and there are lots of uh, lots of caveats in my methods that I'm eager to discuss and that I have discussed in the article that I presented above. So um, I would like to thank you all and I will very much appreciate any comments and suggestions. Thank you.